Bah. So I've been working with a project trying to jump back into you know, computery projects and uh, the industry's collapsed, completely collapsed. I, I don't even, I can't even. This is a fairly large company. It's been around for a while. Their instructions keep saying on-premises installation and they're talking about AWS. Talking about AWS. There's supposed to be instructions on how to do an on-premises installation, but they're talking about AWS. They don't contain any requirements. They use the word node three different ways and list three different numbers for the numbers of nodes you need. They use the term jump box. Now, I, I didn't think we still had bastion servers and jump boxes. I thought that was a fad that faded out in the 2000s and everybody figured out that they're not more secure and they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, and if you put a jump box in the way, you have to do a bunch of insecure things so that you can do anything at all. Anyway, uh, apparently we're still using that term incorrectly, but be that as it may, the entire problem is that we have flattened the world to containers. Now we're using containers for everything. So, these particular instructions, for example, are talking about using an R5 large from Amazon, or maybe it's an R5X large, I forget, um, to run Docker or something in Docker. I can't tell. I don't know what you're doing with containers. Like, I, I don't even know what you, what you think these things are or what you think they're for, um, but no. This is not the way to do this. So you sort of have to understand a bunch of computer history to know what the hell is going on. We're letting developers touch things that they don't know anything about and cannot know anything about because they were not trained in it. Right? Developers do not understand networks, systems, systems configuration, operating systems, routing. Like they don't understand, they don't understand computer memory at all, at all. They just don't understand this. They don't understand storage or better yet persistence, which is more encompassing than storage. And the industry is using random terms for everything, for everything. Uh, this particular product requires two databases, uh, MongoDB and uh, uh, Postgres. I'm like, well, nothing requires Postgres because Postgres is SQL and any, almost any application can be done with any SQL database. That's the purpose of SQL. There isn't another reason to use a SQL database. MongoDB is not a database. It's a, doc, it's a structured document store. Uh, it's a persistence layer. Amazon has several persistence layers. And apparently now we have uh, storage types in uh, Kubernetes. Okay, guys, you're not supposed to do that. You're doing something very, very, very wrong if you're putting persistent storage in something that is designed to be ephemeral or go away. Like, what are you doing? Don't do that ever. The whole purpose of microservices, they can blink out of existence and another instance can be spun up. And they're stateless. Well, if you're stateless, you don't need storage. And if you're stateful, don't use microservices and containers ever. This was the problem with Java. So let's review. Three things are happening all at once. We're squishing the world and letting developers do work they can't do. They're just not good at it. And they're not trained for it. And they shouldn't be. It requires different thought to do systems work than it requires to do keyboard programming work. They're just different things. Scripting and software engineering are not the same at all. You don't even think the same way to do them. Systems work. Some, some I know systems guys who are awesome and they can't script. That's okay. I, most network people can't script at all. That's okay. I, it's fine. It's fine to have all these different specialties and disciplines because they're required. Just look at Amazon's offering for network and network security. 
do you understand that stuff? I mean, I do, but I'm a network specialist, among other things. So it's not that big a deal. And I don't understand all of it. But I understand roughly, oh, yeah, you'd use that here and this there. So this flattening down to a single discipline is a problem. Compute is not a single discipline. Software engineering is not a discipline that encompasses operating system configuration and framework configuration and persistence configuration and network configuration and service configuration. No, no. And, and you can't have one person know all those things well enough to do it well enough. It's that simple. So it's helpful to know where containers came from. So the first containerized system was Java. All Java software runs in a container. That's right. The JVM, Java Virtual Machine, is a container. All containers are a type of virtual machine. They were called, used to be called, uh, I believe it's uh, Layer 3 Virtual Machines. Layer 3 Virtual Machines run on an operating system. The operating system hands them virtual operating system handles to think they're running isolated from all other things. This is done in software at the software layer. This was invented by Sun Microsystems. Why did Sun invent this? You may ask. You should ask. It's important. Sun invented this because Sun had moved to risk, reduced instruction set architecture. Uh, Risk is a stupid idea. Don't ever do that. Uh, it was a fa risk failed. Like risk failed a lot decades and decades ago. Right? Risk has repeatedly failed. By the way, it's an experiment that's been done many, many times. It has very limited uses. The best usage for risk is GPUs. GPUs are basically risk systems. They're awesome. I get it. Uh, specialized use. Okay, you don't want to use it in a CPU ever. There are some apparent exceptions to this that end up not being exceptions, but that's a much longer video. I'm not going to do that video, um, or most likely not. Um, because they did that, they used less die space. So now they were able to use less die space, right? Uh, by the way, the cost of risk is memory, right? You want to run reduced in instruction set? Your software is bigger in memory, right? So you're, you're trading CPU die, for memory. Memory used to be a very high dollar. I very you think memory is expensive today? <laughs> Look at workstation memory prices from the late 80s and, and, and the 90s and stuff. Memory was way expensive. It was the most expensive component of the machine, not the CPU. So you're, you're, you're trading memory for die space. We could argue about whether it's a good trade. I really don't care. Risk failed. It failed. Still failed continues to fail every time they do it. Okay. There are mathematical reasons why this will always be true. I don't know why they don't know this. They're big math brain people and they can't figure out basic arithmetic. That meant they could put more cores on the same size die. So that's what Sun did. They had very high core count, core count machines. Very high. Higher than we have today in some cases. A 64-core Sun workstation was not uncommon in the 90s, my friends. Not at all. All right, they had the die space. They also had huge amounts of 16 and 32 gig machines when such a thing was unheard of in the PC space. Okay, what problem does this create? Oh, well, unless you write your software very specifically, you can't take advantage of those cores. And even if you do, most workloads can't take advantage of those cores. Oh my, what do we do? I know we create a bunch of little machines with single cores or three cores or four cores, whatever, and we separate it so that we can use different configurations and they look like different machines. This is the birth of cloud computing for real. This is where, I, this isn't the, the very first time anybody did this, IBM had this technology on the mainframes. I remember having a discussion with somebody who said, we should buy a, I think it was a million dollars. It might've been half a million dollars. He said, 
Uh, that was back when that was real money. Uh, right now, it's just walking around money, gas and grocery money. Um, he said, we should buy one of those uh, and run Linux virtual machines on it. The Linux virtual machine for IDM was brandy new code, brandy new code at the time. Uh, and, and, and offer it as a cloud. And then we'd have a really cheap cloud system that, you know, with a hundred percent uptime guaranteed by IBM. And I was like, well, that's actually, it's not a bad idea. Unfortunately, the, the Z90, I think it's the Z90, uh, kernel code or whatever. Uh, it, it wasn't in a good way. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it would have worked, but my goodness, what a mess to get everything to work. Right. Um, so I, IBM could run VMs in that way, right? You could. You know, you definitely give somebody their own little virtual CPUs and hosting machines and all that very easily on an IBM mainframe. But Sun was really the first one to sort of take advantage of this in that way and put it in a workstation and uh, uh, and server market, right? And so you know, you've got mainframes, you've got mini frames, and you've got servers and workstations, right? They go together. Um, and 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 terminals. You still had terminals, not many, but whatever. You had X X terms and stuff were still going in the '90s. So Sun's got basically mini frame to mainframe power in a server, relatively compact. I mean, they weren't small servers, but uh, maybe two, maybe three ATX case sizes in some cases for, for a decent size server, it's a huge machine basically. Um, also hella expensive. So they developed this containerization technology. Containers were developed by Sun. They got used by Java. Java was originally to run hardware, it was for embedded hardware, embedded systems, which is laughable now because it's so inefficient. You can't run Java on embedded systems for the most part, although it's still a reasonable use case. Uh, the Equalogic disk system used uh, Java for their uh, GUI. So you could connect directly to their embedded machine. It was a little tiny computer in the back of a, a big set of disks. Um, I have one. They're awesome. Um, still the best storage product ever built by far. Beats everything by leaps and bounds, including uh, EMC. We could compete with EMC, actually. Um, all the way up and down the scale. $30,000 box. You could scale it all the way up to EMC levels uh, for cheaper money and have a faster, better piece, cheaper, cheaper infrastructure hardware. Um, that loaded, it, it ran Java. So when you attach to the server, you get a Java app running in your browser, and that's how you manage your array. It was thoroughly enclosed. You didn't need to load any software to manage your array. It was fantastic. It was a genius use of Java, but you know, relatively large, right? Not for modern embedded systems. Uh, you're not you're you're not running Java on a on a on a Pi uh, very very quickly, right? It's it's going to be slow. Um, but on a big server, when you've got a lot of apps, you may have, well, how did Java get so popular? Well, the banks used it because they had Sun machines. It's a very efficient way to use all your extra cores that you otherwise can't use by running a single piece of software. So that's where all this containerization comes from. And then eventually you get layer two VMs where you're running. So that's like VirtualBox, right? VirtualBox or uh, VMware Workstation, same thing. Uh, they, they're using layer two VMs, right? We're using the OS and running VMs in hardware on top of your existing OS, right? Those aren't containers. Containers take a section of your OS and section it off, right? And so the advantage to containers, and, and this advantage is lost in most container implementations, by the way. So we're using containers incorrectly already, right? The advantage to containers is you have a library loaded. Say standard dot so because that's a standard library that gets loaded in 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 Linux land in Unix land, right? You don't reload it in your container because it's already loaded in a core operating system and it just gets its own uh, memory map space effect effectively. There's a lot more to it. I I get that. I, I, I'm not going to go into the deep dark details. You go research that on your own if you're actually interested. I don't suggest you do though. Get your own memory maps. It looks like you have two copies, but you don't. It just keeps track of entry and exit points because the containers give you that for free. You don't have to change the code at all. It just swaps the memory map. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Code that's running is still there. So you don't have to load two copies of a shared library that's shared between the OS that you're running 
and the container and the other containers, by the way. Right? So all the code that runs on the OS is shared with all the containers. This keeps the memory footprint small, the expensive thing, the thing that's costing you because you have fewer cores. So for Sun, this is a genius idea. It's brilliant because now their machines are far more efficient with memory and CPU. Of course, their machines are running a lot hotter because their CPUs are closer to 80% utilized. Now, at this same time, on the Intel side, CPUs are never more than 20% loaded, ever, ever. I know, I know. What am I OS? You said, no, no, OS lies. OS lies like a cheap plastic rug, okay? No, never. It's very hard to load a CPU, like even a Pentium, very hard to load a Pentium. You can do it. I'm not saying it's impossible. You can do it, but it usually takes specialized software. You're not doing it on a desktop ever. It's never going to happen. Windows is too inefficient. When Windows NT in particular, you know, uh, 800,000 uh, uh, CPU cycles to run a, a freaking uh, memory fetch operation, right? To run an IO operation. Okay. <laughs> it's going to show 100% utilization. CPU is doing nothing. No, no ops. 800,000 no ops. Okay. 800,000 is a lot, <laughs> right? Like, you ain't doing nothing. NT was horrifically slow. It was poorly designed. Most poorly designed operating system I've ever seen. It's terrible. Um, I don't think you could. I don't think you could deliberately misdesign and poorly design an operating system uh, like that. I, I don't think you could beat NT at it. It was just terrible. David Collar's awful, awful, awful designer. Awful. Long history of failed, bogus, garbage operating system designs, and and poor implementations. Oh my goodness. Look at the Vax work he did before at NT. Why you'd hire him to do anything, I have no idea. Um, just terrible. So that inefficiency doesn't exist on the Sun. It's one of the big Sun selling points, by the way, was how efficient you could use these servers. Now, not everybody did. I get that. In the early days, a lot of these cloud services where they give you VMs were running on Suns because it was really really cash efficient to do so if you had the upfront cash to spend, you know, $100,000 on sun equipment, right? Because uh, you needed a bunch of sun equipment. And, and you're typically looking at, you know, high disk speeds, right? Because you're using fiber channel and crazy stuff. And, you know, instead of, uh, you know, off the shelf uh, uh, server hardware that, that comes with NT, right? So the, the very expensive um, uh, Microsoft or even high on Linux machines, right? Uh, that stuff was low-end cost for Sun equipment, right? So Sun's way expensive. And they're not the only vendor, but they're the big, they're the big vendor. So this idea of containers makes a lot of sense. It makes your machines hella more efficient on both fronts because it takes advantage of the cores without increasing memory usage, which is just a genius move on their part, right? There's all this shared memory all of a sudden that wasn't shared before, because you're only doing different entry and exit points on your shared memory for your running operations. And all of this is you know, wrapped up in how you do your memory maps and stuff like that. Well, guess what? Sun from the beginning had MMUs, right? They had memory processors. Uh, it, you didn't have that. Uh, or you didn't have the same level of it anyway on the, on the Intel hardware, right? It wasn't there. So that's what containers come from. Now. At some point, Intel CPUs become really fast and really powerful. So now you've got overpowered machines everywhere. And this is where cloud comes from, right? And now all of a sudden, because you go to, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to a cloud data center or if you've actually set one up. I've set up several clouds it's back in the day before they were called clouds even. It's not that hard, right? Um, but all you're doing is changing your layer of abstraction. Now, instead of abstracting at the software you're running, you're abstracting at the machine it's running on, right? And once you abstract to the machine layer, is it running on the machine in the top of the rack or the bottom of the rack or the middle of the rack, for example? Um, there's no reason why you can't virtualize that. Is it running on a virtual machine at the hardware layer, layer one virtual machine? That's uh, uh, VMware ESX. 
right? That's a kernel. It's not an operating system. It's a kernel that runs directly on your hardware. It's tiny, basically. It's a thin kernel. Um, and all it does is serve VMs. So, and, and this is, these VMs are built into the hardware. We're not at the container layer. Containers, containers can be implemented in hardware, but they're not. They're implemented in the OS. That's why if you look at the commit history for Linux, you'll see they keep adding container support. Now they may add container support by using some of the hardware functions for VMs. I understand that, but containers are fundamentally not hardware layer things, right? And they don't, they can be implemented without any hardware changes. In theory, if you had a different kind of chip, which we don't anymore, unfortunately, flattening of the world, there's no more chip manufacturers, right? There's only a handful of CPUs now um, and they all suck. Uh, it, you could implement that without having any hardware VM functions. Now there's certain memory management functions you need, as I mentioned earlier. It's important to know the history, okay? On-prem is not, I'm reading docs, it's on-prem and they're talking about AWS. I'm like, okay. AWS is never on premises ever. I don't know what you're talking about. You need to learn how to speak because I can't make sense of your directions. When you're saying on prem, I'm referring to AWS because those two things are fundamentally opposed, right? It's either in the cloud or it's on your local machine in your office. It can't be both, all right? Uh, but nobody knows this anymore, right? Like a microservice is supposed to be small. That's what the word micro means. Services are supposed to be stateless. That means you don't need persistence. All of your persistence should be out of your service layer. There should be no persistence in a cluster ever, right? The purpose of a cluster is the whole cluster can go down and be spun back up and pick up right where it left off. It's a very easy, well-known design in software, or at least it used to be. I don't know what happened to the knowledge. Apparently it's vanished. I know how to do it. It's not that hard, really. It's an architecture issue. What did we throw out with Agile? Architecture. The way to know how to do these things better or correctly is to look at the history. The history is all there. We have the whole internet. The history of computers and the history of internet are pretty well tied together. And so most of the good history of, the, of computers is sitting on the internet. Lucky us. You can just look this stuff up. You need to understand certain core concepts. But once you understand those concepts, you're in. Good as gold. Problem solved. Now, the bigger problem is this won't help you if you're dealing with idiots who don't understand these concepts. Because now the industry is so big and things are so complex, you just have to work with a team that you work well with. Do you want to make money? Keep your head down and do what you're told. As my buddy Bruce was, was saying, I'm like, yeah, I know that trick. Uh, but also, I, you know, I'm a consultant. I, what do consultants deal in? They deal in requirements, right? And conditions. What is our condition for success? What are we calling success? That's what I want to know. Because that's what I want to deliver as a consultant. Right? You should want to deliver it as an employee too. It's just a lot harder because there's politics and all these other things in the way. When you're consultant, there's politics, but they're, they're not at your level, right? Usually somebody else is getting you that job and all you need to worry about is your analysis work, right? And giving the right advice and, and, and watching them not take it, even though they're paying you an ungodly amount of money. And then they fail and you go, yeah, this is why. If you fail an analysis report, you walk away and go get another contract. This is how these things go. Um, you want to know what does it look like when it's finished? What does it look like when it works, right? You don't, in, in consulting, you don't want to follow what they're doing now because what they're doing now doesn't work. That's why you're there, right? So you have to keep these things in mind. It's not always follow the lead. Uh, what, what if the, what if the lead failed, right? One of the last big projects I actually worked on, we didn't get the contract, unfortunately, because the guy running the project <laughs> didn't pay attention and fell into a political trap. But 
that's, you know, that wasn't my job. I was a tech guy. He told me I hit it out of the park. I was like, thank you. I should hope so. I'm very good at what I do. Um, I've spent years doing it and be good at it. It took years. It took decades, right? They had spent $10 million to update 12 web pages. 12 pages, not sites, pages. They didn't do a release. So it didn't work. $10 million. Now, it's not entirely straightforward. There's an AS400 in the back end. And, but I could have done it myself in three months. They spent a year and $10 million. Or maybe it was longer than a year. But it's $10 million. I remember that. Their idea, they told us this in a meeting, in an all hands for the team. No, no, we're going to succeed this time because we're spending $20 million. And I was like, all right, listen, 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 listen. Give me half a million in three months and I'll just do it by myself. Like, it's cool, right? 12 web pages, guys. It's not that hard. Uh, I mean, it's hard. It's, it wasn't like 12 static web pages, right? And there's an AS400 integration to do. So whatever. But like, it's not that hard. <laughs> right? It's not that difficult. They had a whole team. Uh, a whole team backed up with huge infrastructure teams, which was the problem, by the way, but different, different story for a different day. Um, they, they, they couldn't do version control right. That's what I was there for, to show them how to do version control. They loved it, by the way. They're like, oh my God, this is the best version control presentation we've ever gotten. I'm like, thank you. I hope so. I better be the best at this. <laughs> I've been doing it long enough. I was there when they started version control, practically. Um, all this information is out there, but it takes a lot of research and a lot of talking to people, right? To understand why these things were built and therefore what their optimal use case is. If you want to get work done, you need to match the tools to the task. And if you do that, you will be more efficient, which means less stress for you. Right? And you'll get your work done quicker, which means you can get on to better, more important things, right? Like shaving your invisible cat. That's often more important than whatever you're doing in computers. All right. Understand the history. Talk to people about who, who, who know, who've been around. Like, where did this stuff come from? Look up the history online. Spend the research time now, while you're young, especially, right? So that. When the stuff comes up, you know something about it and you know which tools to use. So you don't end up using REST interfaces to pass five gigabytes of data between two microservices. That's a real scenario. I've seen that at three companies that I know of. Don't know why you think that's a valid thing to do. Don't ever do anything like that ever. There are way better ways. Well, you're probably transferring too much data. I don't know why anybody needs to transfer five gigs of data ever, but whatever ingest five gigs of data and transfer it to your persistence layer? Sure. Uh, but anything can do that. Like, I don't know why you do that with a REST interface, certainly. Uh, maybe over time in small chunks. Yeah, that's what REST is for, small chunks of data. Learn this stuff. Learn what it was for. Learn what it's good for and what it can't do well. Because everything is good at a tiny number of things and can't do well all of the other things, right? And that way, yeah, you'll have a lot more moving parts, right? The world won't be flat at all. That's true. Computers is not flat. Persistence layers are real, right? Uh, different storage types are real, right? Whether they're database, raw disk, temporary disk, memory, memory is a persistence layer, right? Um, it, there's a lot of complexity out there. Right. Jump boxes were a mistake. People are using them for automation servers and calling them jump boxes. Don't use a jump box in AWS. Go look it up on Stack Overflow. It's right there. Right. Like security groups are better than jump boxes. Having security groups makes your security less, not more, ironically. Don't do that. It's okay to have an automation server. 
right? Not all your servers need to be clusters or nodes or whatever, right? Different types of servers to offer a service is correct. All the tame type of server to offer a service is not a service, right? Or they're not all the same type of server and you're lying. Either way, don't do that, right? So look, look up the history, know what you're doing, use proper terminologies, people can read your damned instructions and life will go better.